Thank you for tuning in to Power Hour this Wednesday. We have a treat for you, Pastor Peter's teaching uh, from Toronto Celebration Church. I know you're going to love tonight's teaching on prayer. Would you connect with us in Facebook, YouTube, share a link. Let somebody else enjoy this powerful message. Maybe say an amen, your comment in the comment section. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'll have a time of prayer after the service is done uh, today. But again, thank you for tuning in to Power Hour. We're going to go right into a teaching uh, with Pastor Peter here at the Toronto Celebration Church. God bless. You believe that God is on your side? You believe that you have everything what you need? That's so good. I'm so glad to say I don't need Jesus because I have Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? I don't need a breakthrough either. Thank God I got delivered from needing a breakthrough in my life. Because I discovered that the one who broke through lives in me. So I'm not pining, I'm not looking, I'm not hoping for God to do anything for me. I'm so glad for everything he's already done for me. Eh, praise the Lord. I'm so glad. I always like to give my testimony. I got delivered. I got saved from that pining Hope so, longing for, charismatic religion, please Lord come and touch me because I, I got saved and I discovered he has touched me and he lives in me and out of my innermost being flow rivers of living water. So I've been saved from that. I'm not bound by that religion where you never know for sure which foot you're standing on. Am I in his presence now or am I still looking for it? I'm not sure. I'm not Hey, is, is it? Is it it? Is his presence? Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, I, think, I thought I felt it there. No. I got saved from that, and I have 24-7 coverage. It's flowing 24-7. I can be snoring in bed at night, and Jesus Christ. All right, all right. Some people are watching by Facebook. God bless you. Let's just thank God right now. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the good news. I thank you, Lord, for the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I thank you that we are more than conquerors. We are overcomers. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand. You may be seated. You may be seated. You may be seated. All right. They got my fan going to keep me cool. I'll see if it'll do the work. Tilt it up a little bit, Alex. On my face, please. Thank you. See, I got everything set up for to be happy here. They got a new fan for me, except it's cooling my toes, and my toes are fine. The perspiration usually comes on my face, so that would be the area to aim for, even though it's nice to have cool feet. I do that too, all right? Are you happy? So I began a couple of Sundays ago to talk about prayer. And we began by teaching on Jesus' first words on prayer. Following the chronology of what Jesus reveals about prayer. And we discovered the first thing that Jesus ever in the Holy Scripture said about prayer is that hypocrites love to pray. There's something about getting up to pray that hypocrites just love it. That's the first thing Jesus said. And then he expounded in saying that these kind of people, they think that long prayers are better than short ones. And you know, whenever the Bible mentioned the word hypocrites, I know it's talking about somebody else. How many feel the same way? I, you, that must be somebody else that's being addressed. Couldn't be me. But I want to ask you, have you ever been one of those people who felt that your prayers weren't long enough to work? So in Jesus' first teaching, he said, you're wrong. You're a hypocrite for thinking like that. Because, I'm telling you, that fan is just spinning. I don't know if it's going to help me if we just turn it off, but it's not helping me so far, but it might later on. So, so if you've been thinking that long prayers are better than short ones, you're wrong. Short or long doesn't matter. Then Jesus said, 
Some people in this group, they also think that uh, prayer should be repetition of words. I don't know what words you may have heard repeated a lot. Oh, God, move. God, do this. God, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't know what prayer words you heard. But Jesus says, more words aren't better. And so this is not so exciting for people to hear because really what Jesus is doing, he is ruining so many prayer styles. But how many will think that Jesus can teach us something about prayer? So we talked about this. And today I want to ask the question, who changed prayer? Uh, and I want to start by reading a few scripture verses, one that was our key verse last time, Mark 6, 8. Your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So we don't need to uh, bombard heaven with prayer requests. We don't need to inform an ill-informed God of what our need is. Our fathers know what we need before we ask. Then Jesus, in speaking about us, said in John 16, In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So Jesus is saying, in that day when the Holy Spirit has come, you will ask the Father in the name of Jesus. So you take those two verses together with what John wrote and he said, I have this confidence that if I ask anything in his name, he hears me. And if he hears me, I already have what I asked of him. And then you add to that 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that God has already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we could summarize all that to say, God knows what we need. He has already given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And we come to God in full assurance in the name of Jesus. And we receive that which God has provided for us that our joy may be full. How many want your joy to be full today? Come on, let me hear from you. You want your joy to be full. And so I'm saying some of the prayers that we find before Jesus are not applicable anymore because Jesus changed prayer. Let me give you an example. In Genesis 18, we have a great prayer illustration from before Christ. It's, it's Abraham. And it says, Abraham said, suppose there were 50 righteous in the city. Would you also destroy the place? and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it. Far be it from you to do such a, as, a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now that's a good prayer. And what can we learn from that prayer? We learn that God is a God of integrity that God will do right. So sometimes when you have questions and you wonder what happened in this situation and that situation, this is a comforting statement that the God of all the earth will do right. So sometimes people ask questions, what will happen? You know, my, my grandmother or my grandfather never heard the gospel. Well, shall not the God of all the earth do right? That's a good comforting verse. And yet I must say, this prayer is outdated. We don't pray like this today. We don't say, God, if there be 50 righteous in Toronto, will you bless the city? We don't pray like that anymore. God, if there's 40, if there's 30, will you say? We don't pray like that anymore. That's outdated. Because it infers that there would have to be a certain number of people who are righteous in order for God to do something. So why is it that this prayer that is so admired by many Christians is never used in the New Testament? I mean, it would have been maybe considered for Philip when he went to Samaria, a city that we know was full of witchcraft. He could have said this prayer. He could have said, God, if there's 50 righteous, 
Could you send a great revival here in Samaria if there's 40 righteous? But we don't, we don't find that prayer again. Why? Because Jesus changed that prayer. On what basis? Romans 3.10. I think you have it on the PowerPoint. There is none righteous, no, not one. Why do we not pray like Abraham anymore? Because we have a better covenant. We have a better prayer. Because we have discovered we're not going to find one righteous. No, not one. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So no one is righteous. So we don't pray, oh God, I want to be one of those ten righteous in the city. No, in yourself you are not. But we have a better covenant that God provided salvation for the world, though there was not one righteous, no, not one. Praise the Lord. But you can clap. Unless you don't believe the gospel, then don't clap. But if you believe the gospel, give a shout. This is wonderful. This brings us certainty to prayer. So I want to say, don't pray like Abraham. You can learn some things from what Abraham said, but we don't pray like Abraham. Because Jesus has negotiated something better. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, let me give you another prayer example. When there was rebellion in Israel and there was destruction, something terrible happened. And the people were dying in a plague. And it says in Numbers chapter 16, verse 47 to 48, that Aaron, the high priest, he ran into the midst of the assembly and already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped. Now, why don't we do that today? Why, why don't we pray? Some people try to pray like that. They said, oh God, I'm standing between heaven and Canada. I'm staying here. Oh, the country is so sinful, but I'm standing in the gap here. Why don't we, some people pray like that, but I must tell you, your prayers are outdated. Your prayers don't work anymore. Why? Why don't we do that? Why, why didn't Paul do that in Ephesus when they were rioting and doing all kinds of evil? Why didn't he just stand up and say, I'm standing between God and Ephesus, and I'm going to stand here as a mediator. I'm going to stand here and hold back the evil. No, he didn't do that even though some people do that today, because prayer has changed. We don't pray like Aaron prayed. Who changed prayer? Jesus changed prayer. Because Jesus himself is our high priest. He stood between the living and the dead. The plague of sin, the wages of sin has been defeated, not by us, not by our prayers, but by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we don't pray like that. I know many Christians have been praying like this, and no wonder you wore yourself so tired and you got so exhausted. Why do we change it? 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. So Jesus has already stood in the gap. We're not looking for a person to stand in the gap for our city or for our family or for our country. We have a man, the man Christ Jesus, the one who stood in the gap. Him we preach, him we proclaim. Can I hear a yes to that? <laughs> Let me give you another example. Who changed prayer is my first question. Who changed prayer? One of the most popular prayers is 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now Solomon prayed this prayer. Many people have great admiration for this prayer. But I want to submit to you, and I will explain why. Keep the prayer up there, please. That this prayer is not for today. It's outdated. Number one, it didn't work for Solomon because shortly after Solomon prayed this prayer, the people of Israel were taken captive. Look at what the prayer was. He was asking God for three things. That God would hear from heaven. That was number one. Number two, 
that God would forgive the sins of the people, and number three, that God would heal the land. And he said, stated that there were four conditions for this to happen. The people of God had to humble themselves. Then they had to pray. And thirdly, they had to seek the face of God. And then fourthly, turn from their wicked ways. Now that's quite a difficult task to get every Christian in the whole world to humble themselves. I don't even know if I would try to get everybody to humble themselves in this room. It would be a mammoth task if I was going to make sure with my humility thermometer that all of you were sufficient humbling yourself in dust and ashes. That would be a task. And then turn from your wicked ways. And then not just pray words, but really be seeking God's face. How many know this is a big condition? I don't know any time in human history that any group of people were able to do this. And why would they do it? Because they had these three prayer requests that God would be heard from heaven, that God will forgive their sin, and God will heal their land. So scrutinize these prayer requests. I have such good news for you. These three prayer requests have already been answered. Who answered them? Jesus answered them. God has been heard from heaven. When was God heard from heaven? When God so loved the world and he sent his only begotten son from heaven. God was heard from heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why we are not praying, oh God, be heard from heaven. We say, wonderful. We're living in this gospel, this good news time when God has been heard from heaven. We don't pray, oh God, come and forgive the people's sin. Oh God, do something to forgive their sin. No, we say everything that is needed for forgiveness of sin, it has been provided by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the blood of the new covenant which was shed for the forgiveness of many. And his blood is not just the forgiveness for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So we are not looking for a means of forgiveness to be released. Forgiveness has already come. And then we would say the third prayer request was to heal the land. And I submit to you that all the healing that any land, any people, any ethnicity, any family, any individual will ever need, all the healing has already been provided by him who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by whose stripes we have been healed. And so as wonderful and noble as this was for Solomon to pray this prayer, it is outdated. You never find once in the book of Acts that they say, let's gather in Jerusalem. We are under the oppression of the Romans. And let's tell the people that if, if all the Christians in the church now in Jerusalem, if they all humble themselves, and if they all pray, and if they all depart from their wicked ways, then God will release forgiveness of sin. Such foolishness would never have come across their lips. They were very much cognizant that forgiveness of sin has been released. They had walked with the one who said to the man, your sins are forgiven you. Uh, they preach messages like God has appointed one day and one man in which he will deal with all the sins of the world. And that man and that day has already come. His name is Jesus Christ and the sins of the world were dealt with. So they preach the good news. So I want to say to you, get delivered from outmoded prayer styles that only make you feel uh, proud of how what a prayer expert you are and makes you feel like you're so spiritual, but it is a pseudo-spirituality and instead discover what Jesus Christ has done for you. So if that prayer style is over, how many know whenever God takes us out of something, he takes us into something better. So Jesus changed prayer to make prayer better. We are no longer beggarly saying, oh God, oh God. If there's five righteous, can you do something? Now, I know many Christians still have that beggarly look on their face when they pray. I always wonder why Christians put such a pained face on in prayer. 
oh, oh, God. I said, do you do that all the time or is it just in prayer? Do you grimace when you go to Walmart? Are you going like this or, or, or is it just kind of, is it just a routine during the prayer that you feel somehow it enhances your prayer capacity by looking a little ugly in the face and, and, and clamoring like, oh God, you shouldn't be talking like that. If you talk to me like that, I think you're rude. But of course, the Almighty is much more gracious than I am. So you, you see, I don't know why Christians are like that. So, so Jesus takes us into a better prayer style. Everybody say better prayer style. So when I talk about some of these uh, ways that we still try to pray like they did before Jesus came, people say, oh, you don't believe in prayer. Oh, I believe in practice prayer very much. So let me give you just one little nugget here. So, for example, in Luke 11, Jesus is teaching about prayer. And just two verses out of the whole context. He says in verse 9, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Notice it doesn't say to him who knocks, he will have to kick the door down. It says it will be opened. And it said it in such a way that somebody else is opening the door. The door has been opened by somebody else. You just knock and the door is opened by somebody else. Did you get that? It's not you who are going to break down the doors of heaven. By God, you're going to break through and you're going to break down that door. No, the door has already been opened. And by the way, Jesus is that door. Amen. And so here, here, here we learn now. I call these three prayer dimensions that are beautiful. The first one I call the asking dimension of prayer. The ask dimension of prayer. Now, the Bible says many things like, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask for wisdom. It says that you have not because you ask not. Or you ask amiss. You ask something that was not included in the name of Jesus. Uh, so asking is all right, but it's not asking from the beggarly standpoint it is asking from the standpoint of knowing that that which you ask about, you already have. So you make your request known to God, not on the basis, I wonder, God's going to scrutinize this request, but you come with that which Jesus has already provided and you ask. In other words, you take what's yours. You, you take what's yours. For example, if, if I said to you, uh, you know, you can use my car whenever you want. But if I only have one key chain or one key to the car, you would come to me and say, can I have the key? I said, yeah, it's yours. You know, it's yours. I've already said to you the car is yours. So it's yours. So you don't have to come beggarly, oh, please, please, oh, please, could I have the key? I said, I told you, the car is yours. You can, you can drive it. Take it wherever you, you want and then bring it back. And the next time you need it, you can have it again. So it, it is asking from a point of assurance. Everybody say the word appropriate. So, in other words, you take hold of that which is already being given to you. So, we, we, we ask God, but we ask in this full assurance. Something, I know Jesus provided this. This is his will. And so, Lord, I thank you that I have it. We don't have to grimace. We don't have to beg. We don't have to plead. We don't have to kind of sell our case to the Lord. It's settled. It is done. Hallelujah. Oh, we don't say, oh, God, I want to have your presence. Come, come. Why, why are you grimacing for? He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So get over it. He is with you. Hallelujah. This is a surely a good and a peaceful way to live. And look, look, look what it said in the context, verse 13 in Luke 11. If you then being evil, speaking of people other than God, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? 
Notice the phrase, good gifts, and then the Holy Spirit. So we ask good gifts, and then the answer is, you receive the Holy Spirit. So that means anything that comes from the Holy Spirit is associated with being a good gift. Anything that the Holy Spirit gives you is a good gift. So God is a giver of good gifts. So I'm asking you, and I'm saying to you, be very bold. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Don't come beggarly. Why, why can you come boldly? Why does it say come boldly? Because you already have it. It's yours. If it wasn't yours, if you're asking for something that's not yours, you might come hesitantly. You might come and say, I don't know. You know, if you come to me and say, I, I, I like to borrow Peter's car, but I don't know. I don't think he wants to give it up. Well, you should be unsure. If I haven't promised it to you, you shouldn't just take for granted that you can take my car and drive all over down to Georgia or someplace. You can't do that. Uh, you, you'd have to talk me into it. But if I've already said my car is yours, you come full of assurance. And that's how we come to God. We come today full of assurance. I thank you, Lord, that wisdom is mine. You have already given me wisdom. Christ has become to me wisdom. He is my sanctification. He is my righteousness. You never leave me nor forsake you. So thank you, Lord, that you're with me. Full of assurance. Is everybody happy about that? Then it said, second dimension, seek and you will find. The seek dimension. That's why you have many answers to prayer. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, the word is not seeking for him, like, well, where is he? But seek him to dig deeper into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because remember, in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, we have everything given to us that pertains to life and godliness. You know, sometimes we receive an answer to our prayers by seeking. Sometimes you seek the Bible, you seek the Scripture. Sometimes we are praying for something, asking God to show us something, and it's very clear in the Holy Scripture. Sometimes God provides answer when you come to church. That's why it's so very important, as Pastor Nathan and I are teaching and preaching, that we are ministry gifts of God, because many of the things you have been praying about, maybe you've been praying about a situation, we are actually, by the Spirit of God, giving answers from Scripture to you. So you say, oh, I'm seeking the Lord. I hope what you want is you want an angel to come and slap you upside the head. But, but, but the scriptural way, way is that the God, God would speak to you. For example, you may be praying about what your ministry is. And I can tell you right now, you don't need to pray about what your ministry is. It is clearly revealed in the written word. You say, what is it? I'm not going to tell you now. I told you five Sundays ago and 25 Sundays ago. So if you missed that, come back. It'll come back up again. The answer was there. You don't have to pray about it. You're free from that prayer. Maybe you say, oh, Lord... God, God, do something with my relatives. God, shake them up, kick them in the shins. Do something, God. Oh, God, shake them up. You know, if you just come to church and listen to Pastor Nathan and I, you'll get an answer to your prayer. Because we teach here how to deal with your relatives. Don't look at me like that. Like you said, no, no, for example... One of our Ethiopian brothers in the church here, he sent me a, a text message a week or two ago, and it was an article from the Dallas Morning News. And this article was about the fact the study had been done by the Barna Group that less and less Christians across America and Canada, less and less Christians are engaged in spiritual conversations. And they've done studies from previous times that many Christians and evangelical born-again Christians were not that much different, say, from our Catholic friends. Most born-again Christians do not engage in any spiritual conversations outside of church. In fact, I think the percentage among born-again Christians that might have one or two spiritual conversations per year was 13%. 
So for all of our talk about witnessing and sharing God, people don't do it. So then the study research, why don't people have spiritual conversations? And the second highest answer was because, I'll give you the top answer in a moment, but I just for interest sake want to give you the second highest reason given why. Because whenever I start a spiritual conversation, people said, it goes into politics. And I suppose that's for our American Christian friends where so many white evangelicals are really like Donald Trump is God's answer while others don't. So, so they just can't separate the two. So every Thanksgiving dinner, you're throwing the turkey at one another over these issues. So people say, let's not have spiritual conversation. I begin with Jesus, and in two minutes we're discussing Trump. Yeah, that's a problem. I said to one of my American friends, who is your savior, Trump or Jesus? He's thinking about it. Uh, I, anyhow, that was the second why are you looking at me like that? I'm just quoting a research study. I'm not giving any of my opinions. Far would it be for me to try to give any of my opinions. I am merely telling you the facts. But the number one reason why people don't engage in spiritual conversations is because they said, I think 40% said, it brings tension. Brings tension. I found that very interesting. I can say one thing. I never have any tension talking about God to non-believers. None. I never have any tension. That is the most easy, peaceful thing I can possibly do. I might get in tension talking to the odd Pentecostal, I must admit. But, but, but talking to non-believers about God never brings me into any tension. So I was thinking to myself, if 40% of people say that I don't talk spiritual conversations because it brings tension, my question reading the Dallas Morning News was, are they sharing the gospel or are they sharing Christian morality? See, the moment you think that you're sharing the gospel when you share Christian morality... You're going to find out what happens. When you begin to talk to non-believers about Christian morals, they will very quickly, as soon as you throw that Christian morality punch, there's a punch coming back on your chin. It's called Christian hypocrisy. You want to talk about Christian morality? They'll talk about Christian hypocrisy. And boy, have they got a lot of examples. Pedophilia, abuse of children, they got a lot of stuff. You don't want to go there because you're going to get tension. But now, instead of praying, oh God, open the door, if you just come to church and listen to Pastor Nathan and I, we would have been the answer to your prayer because we would so clearly have taught and made it clear that we don't teach morality. We teach the gospel to people. When Jesus came to Zacchaeus, when Jesus came to Zacchaeus, he didn't teach him morality. He didn't say, you're, a ba you're bad. You are a bad boy, Zacchaeus. You've been skimming off the top. You've been taking tax money. You're bad. I'm telling you, you're going to burn, old Zacchaeus. Jesus never said one word about morality to Zacchaeus. He just came to fellowship in his house. You say, well, how do we know that Zacchaeus was a sinner because he himself said so. Jesus never said Zacchaeus was a sinner. Zacchaeus said he was a sinner. That's why, see, I'm giving you the answer to your prayer right here. I'm, everybody say, Pastor Peter is answering prayers now. So you've been praying. How can I broach the subject? How can I talk? And last time we got in a fist fight when I was trying to share Jesus and we got into the question about this and that and we were throwing the pumpkin pie and he threw the pecan pie at me and we stomped out of there and, and I felt so guilty because I, I felt like I had been a bad witness for Jesus. Well, if you would just get the answers to your prayer that come from this pulpit, 
I'm answering your prayer. Stop talking morality. Talk God's love. Listen to what Patricia said. She said, I just discovered God's love. Start talking about that. And if you don't have enough to say on that topic, keep coming to church. We'll give you more. Am I doing any good? So sometimes we seek. Sometimes you see something in the Bible, or sometimes you just come to a service and you say, uh-huh. You know, I've been looking for input, how that prayer I have for my friends could be answered. Oh, he said, God used Pastor Peter to answer my prayer. Don't worry, I'm not going to become proud. You don't even have to tell me. But, 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 but don't think I'm seeking like, God is going to write in fiery letters in the sky. Here are three keys to witnessing to your family. He's not going to do that. We have the Bible. We have Acts chapter 17, which is a great resource. Okay, let me move on. Are you with me? So this is one realm of communicating, is seeking and finding. Sometimes you pray and you read the Bible and you pray and you listen. All right. Now, the third I really love, knock and it shall be open dimension. I love that. Knock and it shall be open. Because to me, this speaks of the deepest kind of prayer. It's a prayer when you don't talk so much. You listen more. It's a picture of the holy of holies in the temple. In the Old Testament was a picture. Pastor Nathan talked about it a few weeks ago. The secret place. He called it the secret place. The holy of holies. I'm talking about a room where you knock and the door is open. And then who opened the door? Jesus made a new and living way. And here's what it says, final verse today, Hebrews 10. Having boldness to enter the holiest, or we could say the secret place, or to open, uh, go into that room where the door is open. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. So something happened in Jesus' flesh. Something happened when he took our sin, when he became our substitute. He did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He defeated evil and hell and, and, and the enemy and, and, and Hades was defeated. We couldn't do it. He did it for us. And then he says, we have a high priest. So let us come with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What does that mean? That there's a room in prayer where the door is open. It's no more you saying, oh Lord, I got my prayer list here. Oh, I'm trying to find the right person to marry. He should be dark haired and he should be 6'5 and he should be rich, a millionaire, and he should drive a Jaguar. You know, it's just not like that. You say, forget the prayer list. And you just in there. Sometimes that involves praying in the spirit. Sometimes that involves meditation. And it says, the way you are in that secret place, in that holy of holies place, in that place where you knock and whoosh, you didn't need to open the door yourself. It was open for you. They, well, you. You come there with full assurance. You come there full assurance of faith. You say, I know I'm in God's presence. and God is here because that's what he promised. And you, I'm sprinkling my conscience from an, e sprinkle my, my heart from an evil conscience. You, know, you don't come and saying, oh, well, you know, I've done something wrong and I'm not worthy. And I've, no, no, you have already sprinkled your conscience from evil things. And your conscience, you're not conscious of that. You're not conscious of your own inabilities. Because we could be conscious of the, these forever, but we are conscious of what Jesus Christ has done. And, and so the heart, full assurance of faith, the heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, but then also our bodies are washed with water, the water of the word. What does that mean? It means it's not some sloppy agape. It's not just a lifestyle where you say, it doesn't matter what I do, I just cuss all day and tell dirty jokes, but I'm going to sprinkle my hearts from an evil conscience. I'm okay. No. It, was talking about, it starts there. It starts with full assurance. I'm loved of God. 
It starts with full assurance, my sins have been put away. But then also that takes outward effects. The body speaks of the outward. And more and more God's holiness and God's sanctification is showing itself in who you are. And you say, I know that's what's happening on the inside. This new life, this assurance I have that God loves me in my worst. God loves me when I've done the worst thing in my life. It begins to affect you on the outside and you are there and God is talking to you and he's speaking to you that's what I talked about last week when I said prayer is to synchronize my thoughts with God's thoughts because sometimes my thoughts get a little squirrely how about yours sometimes you think a little bit wrong I think something wrong. I begin to I begin to have some fear. I begin to imagine something and and, and, and then then when I, I just knock and the door is open. And the Lord begins to show me, you know, it's not quite like you think it is. This is how it is. That person you're thinking about, I love that person also. I'm working on that person. But here's where you are. You are more than a conqueror. You're an overcomer. So I want to invite you in prayer to live in these three realms. You know, this is not like you go from one realm to the next and then the next, like you're graduating. No, all three realms are there. Yes, surely. You make your request known to God. You know what Jesus has provided? You seek and you have an open mind, whether it's from the scripture, whether it comes through a message given here at TICC, or God gives you something in your spirit. But at the same time, prayer is being quiet. In fact, I enjoy quietness. Often I pray in the spirit and then I'm kind of, Tina says, he's in his zone now. She calls it the zone. That's a good name. And sometimes when I'm, she says, I know you're going to go into your zone, she says. That's our word for it. You can call whatever you want. For she calls my zone. It means like I'm, I'm meditating. I'm listening. God is talking to me. God is synchronizing my thoughts with his thoughts. So, so at that moment, Tina knows I shouldn't run up and say, oh, let's go shopping right now. Because then I get to, I want to be in my zone just for a little while. Now, God is always with me, but, but, but I'm in that zone. And when I'm in that zone, I just want to be in the zone. Are you with me? How many know what that zone is all about? Where, 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 where you're being corrected. It's not like you're telling God, do this, and God, do over here, and shake this person up. Oh, God, smack that person in the head. Oh, God, go. no, no. Yeah. It's you who are being changed. Prayer changes me. And so when I come out of prayer, I don't feel like, oh, I told God what to do. He better get started. <laughs> but I come out of prayer, oh, I'm strengthened. I see things more fully as they are. And, and, and I can go back to that asking, make my request known, seeking. But then I'm also in that, in that room, in my secret place. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, it's like Pastor Nathan and I, we don't plan to follow the same things, but I just can't help but notice. I listen to what he's preaching. We kind of, it almost sounds like we're on the same series, but this is, this, is, this is what the Christian life is about. So I put this to summarize it. Final PowerPoint. Jesus changed prayer from beggarly petitions into three beautiful dimensions of relationship. These are relationship dimensions where you, you're not coming in and saying, God, I demand, heal me. No, no. You said, God, if you don't heal me, I'm going to jump out the window. You know, it's, it's relationship. You say, Lord, I thank you that you provided healing and life for me, that everything I need is provided, and I'm here appropriating what is mine. It's such a beautiful thing. Hallelujah. Amen. You are there in the boardroom with the Holy Spirit, so to speak. The Holy Spirit is the chairman of the board, but you are on the board of directors. Isn't that beautiful? You are there. You're allowed to speak, but you also listen and you receive. Oh, thank you, Jesus. If you got something out of this, give the Lord a big praise right now. Give the Lord a big praise. Everybody stand up all over this room. Everybody stand up right now. Let's just pray for a little moment. Let's just pray. Take about 30 seconds, lift your hand up and just begin to thank God right now that you have everything that you need, that everything has been provided in Jesus. You are so much loved by God. 
Oh, thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for an open heart, for a receptive heart, for a teachable heart. Well, we have the attitude we can learn more. We can pick up more. We're not stuck but we are willing to be corrected, to be aligned uh, with your purposes, to have our thoughts synchronized with yours, that we're flowing together. I thank you for this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I give you praise. I thank you for it, Lord. Amen and amen. Amen. Give the Lord big praise. Hallelujah. You know, salvation happens like that. People discover by seeking something. They, they, they discover, I'm loved by God. They discover that I can't make myself righteous. It's a discovery. I thought if I just did my best, if I pulled myself up by the bootstraps, God would accept me. And then they discover, no, that's not the way it is. I could never make myself worthy. I could never make myself good enough. So then they have a discovery. They say, well, if I couldn't do that, how does it happen? And then the discovery comes, Jesus has done it for you. He has made a new and living way. You come as you are. You don't have to brush yourself off of all your guilt and sin and everything. Come as you are. Come to receive just as you are this beautiful new life that God has provided for you. I tell you, I'm happy to be a believer in Jesus. How many are happy to be a believer in Jesus? I am happy to live in the total assurance that I'm loved by God. And so if you say, Peter, I want to receive that, I want to be included in that, would you lift your hand as a signal that you want, you want like to receive that? And then I want to include you in a prayer. But if you say, Peter, I want that, lift your hand way up high right now. Wherever you're standing, lift it up way up high. Lift it up way up. God bless you. God bless you over here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Over here in the back as well. Yes, I see you over here as well. Let's everybody pray together. Would you pray with me? Would you say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you that Jesus took my sin. Jesus did for me what I could never do for myself. Thank you for loving me. And I confess now, Jesus is Lord. My Lord. Jesus is alive. And come and live in me, Lord. Amen. Oh, give the Lord a big praise for that. Give the Lord a big praise for that. Now, now, now we have so many people here right now. You know, last week I was preaching in a church. It was a little smaller church. And I enjoyed it so much because I took time. You know, I prayed for people one by one like I do in the afternoon services here. We had so much fun. And so many people were healed. I was finding out all about their problems. And then prayed the prayer of faith on the spot. So I enjoy that, but, but we're a little bit too many people for that because we'll, we'll, there'll be no lunch break if we do that. So I, so I have to adjust to how many we are here now, and I ha have to adjust to that I can't have all the fun myself. I don't want to be a hog for all the fun. Come on now, don't you, don't you just, you don't want one person to have all the fun. How many want to have some of the fun yourself, all right? How many want to have some fun yourself? Wave, wave your hand at me. All right, let's do that. Let's take about one and a half minutes. If you're sick in your body, would you let another fun-loving believer like me lay hands on you and minister Jesus' healing to you? And we're just going to say, ask the Lord, say, thank you, Lord, for healing this person. It belongs to us already. If you're sick in your body or if you know somebody else who's sick, maybe that your heart is burdened because of that person, or maybe it's something that is heavy on your heart, a heavy sorrow, heavy burden, and you say, I want someone to agree with me about that. Couldn't we take a minute and a half to do that? And I tell you, you leave here different than when you came. Because there's power in joining together in prayer. Amen. So if you say, I have a need like that, lift your hand way up high right now. Yes, I see all kinds of people. Just hold it up for about 30 seconds so we can see. Could I ask some of the beautiful believers here, would you just find somebody close to you and lay hands on that person? Just go to that person. Here. Barton, one of our, in the healing room ministry, there's somebody right behind you there, Barton. You just pray. There's several people right behind you, in fact, there. Somebody else over here. Let's, let, let's pray. Let's pray. Sometimes we do that right in the front here. 
the healing room ministers come here, but why don't we just do it right where you are right now. We still have that time and we have the opportunity for all of us joining together. So just everybody found someone to pray with you. Would you take about a minute right now and just pray? I want prayer partners, you pray right there where they are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we come in this dimension of asking because we know that whatever we ask, we have already received it. And I give you praise. I give you thanks, Lord. I thank you for healing belonging to us. I thank you, Lord, for, for life belonging to us. I thank you for the gifts of healing by the Spirit. I thank you for this, Father. I thank you right now for health from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. We thank you for health in the body right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you, Lord. Come on, pray for another 30 seconds and thank God for health and life, spirit, soul, and body. Those of you who are watching by Facebook, I want you where you are. Uh, while people are praying here in the auditorium for others, I want to ask you to lift up your hand where you are in front of your Facebook, in front of your social media right now, and I'm going to believe Jesus to touch you. I know, as always, there must be a number of countries represented here, and I, I, while people are praying, keep praying, people, keep praying, keep praying. We have uh, something like 1,400 people viewing from all over the world, from India. People are tuning in from India right now, from Sweden, from Indonesia, Pakistan. Isn't that beautiful? Ontario is always high as well. And Canada, that's good. And Toronto. But let's just keep praying. And the rest of you, just pray with me right now. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this prayer revolution where prayer is not a drudgery. Prayer is not trying to persuade you to do something, Lord. But prayer is the joyful appropriation of what we have already received. I give you thanks for it in the name of Jesus. I give you thanks, Lord. I thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you for being a part of tonight's service. We'd love to pray with you. Would you put your prayer request in the comment section or uh, email it to prayer at TICC.ca. We'd love to partner with you uh, in prayer. Also, we take this opportunity of every of this service here on Power Hour to participate one another with our tithes and our offerings. No, it's the giving family. It's your generosity, your tithes, your offerings that make uh, the outreach and the, 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 the ministry work of this church family possible. And you're doing that. You're expanding the kingdom of God. If you're part of the Toronto Celebration Church family living here in Toronto, you can see information how you can give tonight. We need to hear from you. We yeah, we're starting a new year and we, we have uh, programs, missions programs, and, and we've made a commitment to continue giving, continue giving our support. So we need to hear from you. Thank you for, whether it be e-transfer or our website, Tithely. Thank you for your generosity. If you're part of our worldwide family, we need to hear from you as well. And you can see the information how you can give uh, on the screen. Father, I thank you for every person tonight who's allowing your faith, your love to, to motivate them to be uh, generous, to give uh, their tithes and offerings. Father, we thank you for every giver. Thank you that we're blessed in our giving. And we thank you that you bless every person now in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you uh, in Jesus' mighty name. Well, we appreciate you tuning in tonight. Remember, every Wednesday night, we've got another powerful teaching here on Power. Uh, our this uh, the week's not done yet Friday night we have Power Chapel and also Rain Youth and then of course Sunday another great experience together we're believing God together for your life uh, and we believe the best is yet to come we love you we're praying for you and we can't wait to see you again when we meet uh, again God bless